Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. I appreciate Brian and the team leading us in worship this morning. And I've got a question for you as we start off, because I'm curious. When I say the word conflict, how many of you guys just honestly get excited? Come on, look around your living room, look around the coffee house, wherever you're watching this morning or, or today, that, that when I say the word conflict, there's just something in you. You go, you know what? I thrive in conflict because there's always one or two psychos in every room, right? I mean, and it may be you. You may be the psycho in your room today that you would say, I thrive in conflict. You know, there's, um, for most of us, we don't thrive in conflict, do we? I mean, there's just not something we, we wake up and go, you know what, today I think I'm gonna create as much conflict as I can. I, I know the older I get, it seems like that I obsess over conflict. It's this thing called critics math. I don't know if you know what that is, but you know, somebody can walk up to you and give you a thousand compliments and one person will give you one critical comment and you will discount all the thousand compliments and focus on that one negative thing. And you replay it and you obsess. I rage sometimes inside and I go around and <clears throat> even if it's somebody that I love, I will replay it over and over my head. I'll drive home sometimes and, and I'm replaying the conversation and may, maybe you do that and, and I'll get all angst and moody and, and distant and I'll even drink too much soda and eat food and not good food, you know, and, and lots of chocolate and, and stuff and bread and stuff I don't need to eat. And, and I get gassy and bloated. And it's just kind of, it's, you know, it's just, I don't do well with that. So I've kind of come up with this whole definition of conflict because we've been talking about battle over the last few weeks. And, and uh, you know, basically conflict is this, it's your void of peace. You're just void of peace. And when you're in conflict, you're void of peace. Do you connect with that? Do you kind of see where that, because see, here's the bottom line in this. I don't think there's anybody listening today, whether you're a believer in Jesus or not, maybe your girlfriend just said, hey, you got to watch this, or your mama, you're home, and they're watching it, and you're in the living room, and you're stuck, can't get away. But here's what I know. Everybody struggles with conflict on some level. So here's what I want you to do this morning. I want you to pull out your notes, if you're a note taker, your journal, or whatever, and uh, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 again this morning, and I want you to write at the top of your notes, we're going to put it on the screen, just go Go ahead and put it right at the top of your notes that battle or conflict is inevitable, but misery is optional. Let me say that again. Battle or conflict is inevitable, but misery is optional. I'm going to ask the guys to leave that statement up there for a few minutes because here's what I know about battle and crisis is that sometimes battle and crisis will crush people, and we've noticed that. We've seen a lot of people over the last five to ten, six weeks, eight weeks, some, somewhere in there, that we've seen a lot of people with the uncertainty and fear. It's crushing them that, that they're scared and they're, they don't want to go out and they don't want to reengage and they don't know what to do, and, and yet they want to reengage and, and they want to, but they're, they're locked in that and it crushes. But here's what we also know is it changes us. And I've watched that because I've seen people get kinder and more loving and more servant oriented and more neighborly than I've probably seen in all of my ministry days. And I've watched that during this crisis that it's bringing out the best in people. But I, I just got to tell you, I, I, I don't even want to be say this, but I got to be honest, but it's also made some people more irritable and distant. Amen. And maybe you live with them. I know. So even combative. And we see the two polarizing sides of this whole issues of what's going on in our world today. 
that there's this combat going on and we're lobbing these bombs back and forth at each other. You see, battle and conflict is inevitable, but misery is optional. And all the stuff that's been changing and all the good things that's happened in our lives for many of us. And for me, I have to be careful because I realize that I'm a forgetful people. I'm a forgetful person. And what I mean by that, I think it's easy that when we think if we can just get back in the building and we can just get back doing church, which by the way, we're doing church right now in your living room. And I did church last night in my garage and uh, we can do church anywhere. But I'm talking about when we gather back in this building, we'll tend to forget all that God has done over these last eight weeks. And what happens for me is I'm even spiritually forgetful. I've been a follower of Jesus and his teaching since I was a teenager. And I can honestly say that I've experienced hundreds, if not thousands of blessings and miracles that God's done in my journey. I'm, I've been blown away even this year at the blessings that's come to our family as I watch God provide and do things and, and give us uh, just this incredible favor that we get to enjoy in him. And yet he showed me so much favor and I've received so many blessings and I've seen him do good and, and that he's personal and that he's powerful and that he's wonderful. And I, I can't tell you how many times a day that I say, God, you're good. And how many times I've said it here when I've prayed with you and prayed for you that God is good. And I say it all the time, but then bam, adversity hits, right? Conflict, the critic comes along, the crisis in our world, the pandemic. And all of a sudden, life gets chaotic and the 401k is just busted. And what happens is the door of uncertainty kicks open and fear comes charging in. You ever been there? You see, for faith people, we're told all throughout the scripture, fear not. Fear not, it's out on our sign right now. Fear not, do not be afraid. And it's a common theme of the Bible. And the reason is, is because forgetful people become fearful people. When we forget God's faithfulness in the past, and you and I forget God's faithfulness in the past, and what happens is we become fearful in the presence. When we forget what God's done all through our journey, when all of a sudden adversity comes in and bam, we forget and we forget about those things. And what I've learned in my own spiritual journey is this, you might write this down, the strength of my fear reveals the depth of my faith. The strength of my fear, when I'm real, real, I'm talking about when I'm afraid and I'm, and I'm worrying, it actually reveals the shallowness of my faith when I immediately run to that. When I move into a place where I don't see God as my refuge, where I start looking to other things and people's approval and, and maybe the government or maybe my job and, and I start looking at all those other things and all of a sudden fear rushes in and it reveals just how shallow I am at times. And maybe you can connect to that. And instead I turn to worry and fear and even insecurity and what I've learned over the years is those things never promise to be very good options because worry and fear and insecurity happens when Everything is about me and I take my eyes off God and I, I maximize me and I minimize God. You ever been there? That in crisis and that battle moment? And you may be sitting here thinking this morning, well, I, you know, Edward, I, I live with insecurity and fear and worry. I mean, how can I have security? I mean, how can I have the knowledge of this security that you're talking about in the midst of my own insecurity? We've been in Ephesians chapter six of the last now, this will be five weeks that we've been there, and, and you can turn there in your Bibles or your apps. And, you know, when Paul was writing with that, he was talking about how we are going to be in a battle. And, and what I love about it is he says we win. He says if we will stand firm, that we will win. If we'll take the armor and put it on, that if, when we stand firm, that, that we will be standing at the end of the battle. But each of us have a battle for our hearts and our minds and our souls. And, and as I've said over the last couple of weeks, that the battle of the mind is the most crucial battle of all because what we think turns into what we do and what we think turns into what we believe and what we believe determines what we do. And so it's important that we protect the mind. And so Paul here is talking about the armor of God. And last week we talked about prayers for you to act up in your prayer life. And I hope that you've been acting up this last week. And if not, you can go back and watch that and, and maybe pick up some of those things. But let's pick up in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter six and let's read this again. Paul says, finally, 
Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. By the way, your struggle is not against your spouse or anybody at your job or anywhere else. Notice what he's saying for the believer, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, because we're in this battle, because we realize, and the enemy always wants to make it about a person in front of you, and we sometimes will take it out on them, not realizing that this is a battle for the mind. Remember, we have have a choice and we don't have to be miserable, okay? And so he says, therefore, in verse 13, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you are done, after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then. Now skip down to verse 17 because he lists all those and we've talked about those, but there's one we've not talked about. And I want you to notice the connection between the helmet that we studied just a few weeks ago and this next piece of armor. He says, now take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now remember, the battle of the mind is the most crucial battle of all. Because it's your mind and your thoughts. That's where they're developed and fed is in your mind. And that leads to action and behavior. Remember that old statement when computers were brand new. Garbage in equals garbage out. And so we must protect the mind, okay? In fact, Aristotle said this, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. What we think we will eventually become. See, my mind needs protection from the lies, the half-truths, the false hopes of the world, from impurity, from self-deception, from doubt. You ever doubt during this season? My mind needs protection from discouragement that when the critic comes in or when that one thing comes at me where I elevate that over everything else, it's my mind where that plays. So we learned a few weeks ago that helmet of salvation, remember, we protect our mind. And so we learned that, hey, we're free from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. And so the word of God, the scriptures, is how we wash our mind when we have that helmet on, the sword of the spirit. You see, the sword is both used in combat out here in this, but it's mainly used for right here inside your brain, inside your heart, to make sure your thoughts are protected and pure. See, the word Word of God is a powerful offensive we weapon. It strikes down the enemy. It's one of our most powerful weapons we have at our disposal. And yet, one of the things I've noticed not only in the world, but also in the Christian world, is how the scriptures have almost taken a back seat to pop theology. And it's important that we understand that Paul says, look, it's the word of God that is living and powerful. In fact, look at Hebrews 12. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, I don't know about you, that's powerful. That's the word of God. That's what we call, maybe you grow up calling the Bible. The scriptures, the word of God, that's what Paul's talking about in the sword of the spirit. But we've gotta use it carefully and skillfully. We must know, how, must know how to use the word. And the way we know how to use the word, um, l listen to me, is you got to read the word. I'm going to let that set a minute. you got to read the word. You can take all the classes on the word of God that you want to, but at some point you got to pick up the word of God for yourself and begin to read it. you got to pick it up and read it. And you may be watching, well, Edward, I don't trust the Bible. I don't trust the Bible because the Bible was put together by a bunch of men, and I just don't trust it. Written by men, put together by men, and that Roman emperor, Constantine, and all that. Well, I'm glad you're there. I'm glad you're watching. So let me mention a couple of things, okay? So 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, Paul, again, is writing to young Timothy, and here's what he says. The whole Bible, okay, the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful, underline that word, is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. 
It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. Here's the amazing thing about what Paul's describing here to young Timothy, that the Bible, the scripture was written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. And yet here's what we know. There's no contradictions. God inspired them. God, that they wrote down what God told them to write. It's consistent, it's matchless, and there's nothing else like it. And see, the Bible is not and was never to be used as a science book. And I know the church for a long time tried to make science line up with the Bible and the Bible line up to science. So let me go ahead and say this. The Bible and science are not in competition. And it's time we stop that. Because, but I do want you to notice this, that in Isaiah 40, verse 22, that the Bible points out that the world is round. And that God's word all along knew that. In fact, in Isaiah 40, 22, it says, he who sits above the circle of the earth. And even before science realized the world was round, the scriptures had already validated that. Notice that the earth hangs without holding, without anything holding onto it. In Job 26, 7, it says, he stretches out to the north over the empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing which was not fully realized until thousands of years later when science realized that the earth was not rigidly supported or attached to something. This is interesting. As I was studying this this last week, and I came across a guy named Matthew Fontaine Mari who, who read Psalms chapter 8, verse 8, where it says that the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea and here's what he said, it is enough if the word of God says there are paths in the sea, they must be there and I'm gonna go find them. Now listen to this, it's so cool. He mounted an expedition and it's credited to him as being the man who discovered the ocean currents, all based on what he read in Psalms. It's an amazing story. But let me also mention this about the scriptures, the most scrutinized book in the history of mankind, by the way, is that almost 750 years before Christ, it was prophesied that a child would be born and called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9, verse 6, which he was. It was prophesied that he would be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14, and he was. The psalmist prophesied that he would be rejected by his own people, and he was. It was prophesied that he would be killed and would remain silent, and he did. And if that weren't enough, Hosea prophesied roughly 750 years before Christ that he would raise from the dead on the third day, and he did. With a book that's been vetted and scrutinized and taken apart over 70 to 1,800 years now, incessantly like the scriptures have, and it, yet it stands today as true and unchangeable, what can we gain from that? Why is the scripture so crucial for our survival? So write this down in your notes, because I'm gonna give you six words this morning that that book that we were just talking about, and yeah, a group of men put that together with God's direction, and, and here we still have it today as his truth to, to help us and to help us battle not only our mind, but these principalities that we can't see. So I want you to write this word down. The sword of the spirit is our source of. The sword of the spirit is our source of, and I wanna give you six words this morning and the first one is the sword of the spirit is our source of power. Remember Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. And we see that best in Matthew chapter four. In Matthew chapter four, it was out after Jesus' baptism and Jesus was then led out into the wilderness where he was tempted or tested, maybe your version of the Bible says. And, and during that testing and that temptation in the wilderness, it wasn't the first time that he would be tested. The, the religious groups were gonna test him and, and all the other other guys were going to test him during his journey, but it was tested. And so the, the enemy comes at him. It was the enemy himself that tested him. And he said, if you're the son of God, remember at his baptism that the dove came down and landed on him and the voice of God spoke from heaven, this is my son whom I'm proud of. And, and, and so the devil comes at him and says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus just simply quoted scripture. He quoted Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. It is written, one does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the devil took him up to the holy city, placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, and says, if you're the son of God, then throw yourself down. It's really putting God to the test, just like the children of Israel did all back in the Old Testament. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6, 16. Again, doesn't give him a sermon, just quotes him scripture. Again, it's written, don't test the Lord 
your God. The third temptation came, and he took him up on the mountain and showed him this, all these cities and all these things out there and said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all of this. And Deuteronomy 6.13, Jesus quotes, get behind me, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and you shall serve him only. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. This is big. To answer Scripture with Scripture, as Jesus does here, Jesus gives us a model of how to do battle. He gives us a model that the enemy comes and accuses you and accuses us and brings doubt and gets us to do some things that we know and we're struggling with. Listen, if we're going to do what Jesus did, then we must know the Scripture, which means you got to read the Scripture. we got to have our answer ready because the enemy is not going to give us time. Hey, 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 let me look that up. Give me just a few minutes. Let me seek advice, right? It's like the robber that comes into your home and you go, hey, can you hang on a second? I need to go get my gun or my knife. It doesn't work that way, does it? It's not the way battle works. You see, the tempter of the enemy is a master of timing. He knows when to hit us. He knows the perfect time to hit us. He knows when to come get us. He knows when to attack us in the brain. And so we've got to be ready. And the way we're ready is to be in the Word of God because the sword of the Spirit is our source of power. But number two, the sword of the Spirit is our source of truth, that when the enemy is coming and lying to us, we then have the source, the sword of the Spirit, then to have the, the, the truth of our mind. When Jesus was praying that famous prayer in John chapter 17, verse 17, he says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. In other words, the word of God is where our truth comes from. Not what we think, not what your daddy said, not what your mama said, not what your deacon daddy said, not what your WMU mama said or, or whatever. It's the word of God that we learn truth from. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so it's putting that into our mind. 2 Timothy 3, again, verse 16, is that it helps us to do what is right. In other words, the word of God is not only powerful, but it's that truth that teaches us to do what's right. And here's the third thing. The word, the sword of the spirit, is also not only our source of power and truth, but it's our source of growth. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, like newborn babies crave spirit, pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Listen, we want you to grow up. And if you're only eating one meal a week on Sunday, you're going to starve to death. Can I just say that? you, you got to eat all during the week, man. And it's the Word of God that helps us grow up. I love this statement. Healthy things grow. And if you're constantly going back to the same thing over and over again, critics, 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 and you're the critic or you're always the critic, then guess what? You're probably not growing. And I'm just honest with you. If you're healthy, you're feeding and getting the nourishment from the Word of God that you're growing. See, the sword of the Spirit is your power, source of power, truth, and growth. But the next one is, is the sword of the Spirit is our source of guidance. I love Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. He didn't leave us to feel around in the darkness. He left us a way to, to look at Scripture and pull those principles out. It's our power of truth, of growth, and guidance. And I love this one, that the sword of the Spirit is our source of hope. It's our hope. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us now so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Amen. And lastly, the sword of the Spirit is our source of happiness. Now, therefore, O sons, listen to me, for blessed are happy or prosperous to be admired are they who keep my ways. Proverbs 8, 32 is that we can be happy in the Lord. So what do we do with this? What's our takeaway with this? One of my favorite verses is Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And it says this, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall read and meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will be successful. So here's our takeaway. You ready for this? Three things. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Read it, retain it, reflect it. You ready? Read it, retain it, reflect it. 
Read it, key phrase is absorb God's promises. Designate a time every day, sometime during the day. Listen, it's never been easier with all the Bible apps and all the stuff that we can do to listen to the scripture and work through devotionals and all of that. Absorb the promises, be still, connect with other people. That's why Joshua said, look, this book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but I shall read on it, I shall meditate. In other words, I'm gonna chew on that word. So not only do we read it, we retain it. The key word here is, is be still. Psalms 119.11, this book of the law, Psalms 119.11 talks about slowing down. But Joshua says to meditate on it. That word meditate here is such a great word because some people think of meditating, we're going to cross our legs and chant and do all that kind of crazy. I know that scripture says that we're going to meditate or chew on or ruminate or ponder. And listen, you need to, you need to get still for that to set some time away from your day of hectic, and for some of us don't even know what, what, what day it is from day to day, is to get still before God with his word, the sword of the spirit, to meditate on it, to chew on it. I remember Wednesday morning this last week, I got up early and I sat in my office for almost three hours at home and everybody was asleep. And I can just remember sitting in the silence, enjoying the Father enjoying him in total, complete silence. Basically, here's what that means. Don't forget what God's done. You see, when we read the word and we are retaining the word, we're basically training our mind not to forget he's good. He really is good. Now, you may have gone to a church that wasn't good or had a pastor that wasn't good, but listen, don't confuse that for who God is. Retain his word. And then lastly, reflect. And that key phrase there is connect with other people. He says that you would do everything in accordance with all that is written in it in Joshua 1.8. So read it, retain it, reflect it. And so I want to close with this as the band comes back in James chapter 1. Because James was given some instructions about the word. In James chapter 1, verses 22 and 25, he says, do what, God's, do what God's teaching says. When you only listen and do nothing, you're fooling yourselves. Did you hear that? When you're only listening and you do nothing with that, you're just fooling yourselves. Those who hear God's teaching and do nothing are like people who look at themselves in the mirror. They see their faces and they go away and can forget what they look like. But the truly happy people, hear that? The truly happy people are those who carefully study God's perfect law that makes people free, and they continue to study it. They don't forget what they heard, but they obey what God's teaching says. Those who do this will be made happy. Church, if the mind is the battlefield, he's given us the weapons. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is one of the most crucial pieces for protecting our mind. And so let me leave you with this challenge and the team's gonna lead us in one last song. If you don't know where to start, some of you've tried to do that Bible reading program and you got stuck in Deuteronomy or Leviticus and the book of Numbers. Listen, we wanna help you. And so here's what I want you to do is reach out to one of our staff, one of our elders, your small group leader. Maybe you're watching that with someone right now and ask for help. Say, where do I start? One of the first places we send people is to the book of John. It's just to take a chapter a day in the book of John and begin to work through that. Or maybe the book of 1 John. Let's start somewhere that you would begin to read it. Pick the sword up. Retain it. And then reflect it. That people, when they would see your life, that you would be what James says here, is that as you study the law, it's going to make you free. And can I just tell you this? Free people are contagious people. They are. So find your freedom in the sword of the Spirit. It's the Word of God. I love you, church. I cannot wait to see you all in this room gathered together again one day. Until then, read it, retain it, and reflect it. Let me pray for you. So, Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your Word. Thank you that you didn't leave us unarmed. That God, you took a bunch of messed up, jacked up, screwed up men and women of the scripture. 
(laughs) And you chose them. And God, you used them and inspired them to write down the things that you wanted us to know about you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you gave us all these different perspectives from men and women in the Scripture that we may see you. And then when Jesus came, we see the fullness of who you are in him. Thank you, Father, that you inspired those men and women to write that stuff down, that today we may be nourished on that, that we may know you. And God, I pray for that one that's maybe watching today. They they don't know you. They have never believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Father, there's something in them that's rising up that says, I want some of that. So God, would you give them courage right now just to call out on your name, to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for our sins and three days later rose again and now is seated at your right hand. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody out there that has never done that, they would do that right now in their living room, right now in their office, right now in their car, right now at the coffee shop. That God, they would confess you as their Lord and Savior and God, you'd save them on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, thank you. Help us be nourished this week. I love you. Give us wisdom to love other people as we reflect what you're teaching us. And we ask it all in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Hey, if you made a decision today, we would love to know. There's going to be a decision uh, link that pops up on YouTube or on Facebook, and it's right there on our website if you're watching there. And if you have any decision today or prayer requests, or maybe you've got questions and uh, you're not involved in a small group, maybe you live way off, we would love, love, love to answer your questions and maybe help you journey towards knowing Jesus. We love you. Let's worship together. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.